Good morning. Thank you for joining Mayor Brown's Global Financial Markets Teleconference Series. Today's call is entitled Post-Election Call Impact on Financial Services. If you haven't guessed, we're talking about the presidential election. My name is Larry Platt, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office and a member of the Financial Services Regulatory and Enforcement Practice. I concentrate my practice on a range of matters relating to real estate finance, mortgage banking, and consumer finance in both the primary and secondary markets. First, a couple of housekeeping items. As regular listeners will know, this call is being recorded. We will be emailing an audio link to all participants should you wish to listen to the teleconference again or forward it to your colleagues. In addition, the recording will also be available as a podcast on your preferred podcast platform. Since we will not have a Q&A session, please send your questions regarding today's topics by email to gfm at mayorbrown.com. That's gfm at mayorbrown.com, and we will respond promptly. This is the same email address as on your invitation email. So joining me today are two of my partners, Michael Levy and Andrew Ullman. Michael's a partner in our DC office and a member of the Global White Collar Defense and Compliance Congressional Investigations and Crisis Management and Regulatory Investigation Practices. That's not just one practice, that's a variety of practices. He focuses on white collar defense, investigations, and representation of corporations and individuals in connection with government enforcement initiatives. Andrew also is a partner in our Washington DC office and a member of the public policy, regulatory, and political law practice. Prior to joining Mayor Brown, Andrew served as the Deputy Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and Deputy Director of the U.S. National Economic Council, where he oversaw the development and coordination of all domestic economic policies, including financial services and technology and telecom, energy, and infrastructure. So the format will be Andrew is going to start, and then Michael's going to speak, and then I'm going to add a very short uh, presentation and give our concluding remarks. So with that, Andrew, please take it away. Thanks, Larry. Well, I'll, I'll begin by uh, starting with the election results and then moving from uh, what they tell us about where policy is going to go over the next two years, because a lot of policy is going to be based on what uh, a Biden administration now can do either through the Congress or through financial regulators. So um, noting that there has not been the blue wave that was expected, it looks like we're going to have divided, uh, a divided Congress again. And this is a, uh, definitely an unexpected development. Uh, and what it means is, is that financial regulation will likely come more from the financial regulators than we'll see from Congress. Now, this conclusion, though, it's really important to note, depends on the two runoff uh, Senate uh, elections that are set for um, the uh, 5th of January, those seats, if they both go Democrat, would give the Democrats uh, a very narrow uh, one uh, control over the Senate. And if they Democrats then have unified control of Congress, we fully expect uh, there to be a, a very aggressive legislative agenda that would include financial services. Right now, it looks like Republicans are expected to hold at least one of those seats. So the rest of this analysis assumes that will be the case, but we just wanted to uh, note up front that uh, this uh, scenario that we're about to outline hinges on the fact of the Republicans winning at least one of those seats. With likely Congress too divided to have a major financial regulation uh, legislation like a Dodd-Frank II bill to pass it, um, we fully expect that uh, over the next two years, a Biden administration will really move to focus on financial regulation through uh, the regulators. Now, um, even though the change is not going to be as substantial as we would have seen following a blue wave where Democrats uh, secured unified control of both the White House, House of Representatives, and, and the Senate, we do think uh, the changes coming will be uh, significant uh, for, for many market participants. So, what I'd like to do is just walk through some of the most likely regulatory changes that will happen. Um, before that, though, I'd just like to note that one other consequence of regulation is going to be the primary vehicle for moving policy for the next two years. That uh, means that policy is likely to be somewhat delayed and more muted uh, 
because most of the regulatory spots uh, will not open up immediately. Financial regulation is a little bit different than other areas of policy because so much of it depends on independent regulators who have terms that are, are not uh, uh, coterminous with the president. So for example, uh, uh, at the Fed, uh, Fed governors are appointed for 14-year uh, terms and they cycle off uh, at indeterminate periods over the next couple of years. For example, you know, Randy Quarles, who's vice chair of supervision at the Fed, his term will, the four-year term as vice chair doesn't end until October of, of next year. And so that position will uh, become available uh, for a Biden uh, nomination until next year. So recognizing that there's going to be a delayed application here uh, in some areas, let's walk through the list. We think at the top of that list of areas to, to, that need to be highlighted are uh, environmental policy uh, issues. Uh, we think that you know, one of the areas that really unifies the Democratic Party, uh, which has some, certainly some broad, um, a broad coalition right now from this uh, election, that consists of not only pro progressives on one side and then more moderate suburban districts on the other, one thing that really unifies them is, is the environment. And so we fully expect that those issues to, t to be uh, at the forefront of policy across the board in the Biden administration, but also in financial regulation. So what does this mean in terms of particular policies? Well, first, it means that we, look, uh, we, we expect the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, to be uh, examine how ESG uh, requirements can be uh, imposed on public companies and particularly on environmental disclosures, beefing up what their carbon footprints look like, what their support for carbon energies are, what their expectations are about uh, reducing their carbon footprint uh, uh, will all be mandates that we can see uh, uh, likely coming from, from the SEC in some form uh, over the next uh, two years. We also know that the SEC is one of the um, agencies that uh, a Biden administration uh, will quickly be able to um, have control over because of the fact that um, the existing chair, Jay Clayton, is expected to step down at the end of uh, the administration, freeing up a third slot for a new chair of the SEC. The other area that we see with respect to the environment that will impact financial services companies will be uh, capital uh, charges uh, or other supervisory uh, requirements with regard to lending to uh, uh, carbon-based uh, companies and uh, companies that have high uh, high reliance on, on carbon energy. You know, this can come in the form uh, not only of, of strict uh, and uh, transparent ca new capital charges, but also in the form of uh, supervisory guidance uh, an informal uh, instruction from bank supervisors. So how it actually will be implemented, I think will depend largely on who um, is ultimately appointed to be the new financial regulators, uh, not only at the Fed, but at the Comptroller of the Currency and the FDIC. Uh, we fully expect that uh, financial regulators uh, to impose uh, new regulations on bank lending to uh, energy companies that are uh, focused in carbon-based energy. Uh, another area uh, that we see a Biden administration focusing on is non-bank lending, in particular, non-bank mortgage uh, lending and servicers. You've actually recently seen both uh, Vice Chair Quarles and SEC Chairman Jay Clayton do uh, analysis of, of the impact of the COVID shock on the financial system and both of their initial uh, assessments are that non-banks uh, underperformed and were not resilient enough, and that um, that financial regulators needed to spend more time examining uh, the supervisory regime uh, uh, for those lenders. So we fully expect um, that a Biden administration would likely use the FSOC to examine where non-banks uh, need to have uh, stronger supervision. Um, that also leads to whether or not the Biden administration will use the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC, to designate large players in the, in the marketplace for enhanced supervision by the Federal Reserve. You saw during the Obama administration, several companies were designated, um, uh, including several large insurers. And you know, we fully expect that the FSOC, once a Biden administration uh, secures um, the, the sufficient votes from the, from its members 
to look to designate companies uh, again. Another area uh, kind of related to uh, uh, reforms uh, based on the, uh, uh, the, the initial readouts from Quarles and uh, Clayton's examination of the impact of the COVID shock is on the treasury market. You know, both of their analysis suggests that the treasury market uh, underperformed and needs some structural changes to make it more resilient. So I think that's one area that we'll see some examinations of uh, the regulation on broker dealers. Already there's been discussion about whether or not there should be a central clearinghouse uh, for uh, treasury securities and a reexamination of the role of the um, uh, primary dealer system. Um, another area of reform uh, that's ongoing, and it will be interesting to see uh, how the Biden administration uh, engages on it, is GSD reform. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, led by Secretary Mnuchin and uh, Federal Housing Finance Agency Director Mark Calabria, had been working to end the, the decades-long conservatorship of Ginnie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, that uh, reform work is underway right now. Uh, with the change in uh, the, uh, uh, with the election, and it'll be interesting to see from our perspective on how a Biden administration handles that ongoing reform, on what, whether they let it continue or if they uh, put it uh, pause, put it on pause, and decide to take it in a different direction than where Secretary Mnuchin and Director Calabria have uh, uh, are, are likely to take it. That's when we fully expect to get some guidance in the next two or three months on largely because there's also a Supreme Court case uh, about the validity of the Third Amendment, uh, which governs um, the Treasury support right now for the GSEs, and there's a possibility that the Supreme Court may invalidate it, uh, likely forcing uh, the Treasury and FHFA to um, intervene to come up with a new regulatory regime going forward. So we think GSC reform uh, issues from the, is something the Biden administration is going to have to tackle pretty quickly uh, in its uh, early days. Um, moving on, some other areas that we put on the radar screen are we think that the CFPB will be very active. There'll be uh, a period of time on where the, the Biden administration will, will um, uh, we fully expect, move as quickly as possible to uh, put in a new director at the CFPB. The fact that the Biden administration will have to work likely with a Republican Senate uh, to confirm its nominees uh, it's very likely to temper on how they go about uh, re replacing Director Craninger, although it's very likely that sometime next year um, there will will be a new director of the CFPB appointed by um, the President-elect Biden, uh, who we think will make the CFPB much more aggressive on terms of enforcement um, and also um, uh, uh, with regard to se several specific areas. High on that list will be credit bureaus and credit uh, rating um, ratings. Um, during the campaign, the Biden administration indicated that it would support the creation even of a public credit uh, ratings bureau um, whose ratings would be uh, eligible for use at any federal uh, uh, lending uh, uh, program uh, as a way to replace the, the current uh, private system. Um, even if the public credit rating bureau doesn't come into existence, we fully expect a lot of attention on, on credit bureaus uh, from, the, from the CFPB. Um, and then we also uh, also throw in a couple of other issues to, uh, that we see the administration focusing on. One is on antitrust. Uh, we very much think there's could be an infrastructure bill coming uh, next year. And then overall, just a lot stronger enforcement of, of, of financial crimes. And, um, and I think this is something Larry will talk a little bit more about, particularly in, in the fair lending space. And, and finally, uh, we fully expect that the financial regulators will finalize a new uh, CRA, Community Reinvestment Act uh, rules um, sometime next year. So that's a quick overview of what we see on, uh, see on financial regulation. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Michael, you wanna take it from here? Sure, thanks, Larry. Um, from an enforcement perspective, which is what I'm gonna be speaking to, is, as Andrew said, we are anticipating much more aggressive enforcement in the financial space. Um, I think there are two sort of overarching points to keep in mind. The first is, as I said, the, the government enforcement is likely to get considerably more aggressive in a Biden administration. I don't think we're likely to see a lot of areas where uh, 
there's an enforcement retreat, as was the case four years ago. Um, and secondly, I, I think we all need to recognize that there are going to be some areas where, that are going to be the focus of intense enforcement efforts that we just aren't able to predict right now. Um, there are inevitably unanticipated scandals or crises that, that pop up. Um, people weren't exactly predicting massive accounting fraud investigations before Enron and WorldCom 20 years ago. Most prosecutors had no idea what a credit default swap was um, prior to the financial crisis. So it, chances are that some kind of financial scandal or perceived scandal is going to capture the public's attention sometime in the next four years, and government enforcers are inevitably going to respond to that. So those two points, greater, uh, more aggressive enforcement and unanticipated scandals, just really highlight the importance of maintaining and really improving compliance efforts because it's going to be much easier to stop a problem from happening now than to try to extricate yourself from some kind of government investigation sometime in the next four years. That said, um, you wouldn't be listening to this if you didn't want some kind of predictions about what the focus of enforcement and policy is going to be over the next four years. So starting with sort of the DOJ perspective, I think just generally, not just for the financial sector, there's going to be a more aggressive approach to corporate and white collar enforcement. And if you'll just indulge me to explain a little bit why, I think the first thing you need to keep in mind is that a lot of concerns about criminal justice reform and systemic racism may well lead the DOJ to dedicate fewer resources than it has historically to drug and other street crime prosecutions. And at the same time, you've got calls from the progressive wing of the Democratic Party to take action against big business that that they see exploiting the system to further economic inequality and unfairness. So it, we could well see some of those street crime prosecutors and resources getting shifted to white collar investigations and prosecutions. And actually, sort of aggressive white collar enforcement under Democratic administrations is, is not typical. Historically, in an odd sort of way, the general trend has been that white collar enforcement is actually more active under Republican presidents than Democratic presidents on the theory that Democratic presidents need to prove they're tough on street crime. Republican presidents need to prove they're tough on white collar crime. But um, in those situations, sort of white collar issues arise. Democrats often seek to address through regulation and, and legislation, and the Republican perspective is often more regulation isn't necessary. You just need to lock up the bad apples. Um, the current administration, frankly, disrupted that paradigm, and white collar enforcement went down. And I think the Biden administration may, may disrupt the paradigm as well. I think for the reasons that Andrew mentioned, if the Biden administration isn't either willing or able to address certain white collar issues through regulation or legislation, it may be essential for the DOJ to use enforcement in order to prove to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party that the Biden administration cares about these kinds of issues around economic inequality and the like, and they'll do so by being especially tough on white collar crime. And so I think the way you'll see this play out is more resources devoted to white collar investigations. And if you've got more resources, you're going to have more investigation. It's the old, you know, to every, to every hammer, everything is a nail. And if you've got more hammers, there's going to be more hammering. I think you're also going to see a much more aggressive approach to penalties, not necessarily formally sort of rolling back the recent policies on piling on, for example, which are designed to avoid double and triple penalties when you've got multiple agencies or jurisdictions investigating, but you're more likely to see in individual negotiations, much tougher negotiations, where the DOJ is seeking significantly larger dollar amounts. And I think you're more likely to see sort of a return to so-called regulation through enforcement using DPAs and NPAs, and in particular, a more frequent use of post-resolution monitors than you've seen in the current administration. I think um, you'll see a greater focus on individual accountability and uh, a return to aggressively enforcing the high threshold that the Yates memo put into place in order for a company to receive any cooperation credit. I think that's obviously especially likely if Sally Yates is the new attorney general, but even if she's not, I think you will see a return to that policy. Um, just in general, I think 
companies subject to DOJ investigations are just going to be pushed especially hard to provide information to the government, to point fingers at employees, and, and ultimately pay harsh penalties. In terms of the financial industry, um, I think there are several areas where, um, where you should be aware and alert. Obviously, in the short term, I think there's going to continue to be an emphasis on pandemic fraud, especially PPP and other stimulus programs under the CARE Act. Um, longer term, I think you're going to see an acceleration of uh, some of the focus that we've seen emerging over the past four years already in money laundering, BSA, sanctions matters. There's going to be a continued focus, I think, on corruption, both foreign and domestic. And I think there's, you're going to see increased emphasis in areas where, I, I said before, there's this perception of an unfair financial playing field in order to help satisfy calls for accountability by pro progressives. So tax evasion, it'll be interesting to see whether or not the Biden administration takes the Swiss bank program and reinvigorates that or does some other kind of tax evasion efforts abroad in other countries. Um, at the beginning of the Obama administration, there was a large push on insider trading. It will be interesting to see if that returns. And we've already seen DOJ focus on spoofing and other allegations of market manipulation. I think that's going to continue and, and get stronger. Again, they all harp on this idea of uh, those with access to power and information having an unfair advantage. I also think there's going to be um, additional aggressive activity in the international realm. Um, the FCPA is not going away. Um, President Trump, frankly, expressed intense dislike of the S FCPA early in his administration, but enforcement continued. So I think that's here to stay. It'll also be interesting because international enforcement cooperation has been growing and has continued to grow over the past four years. It may well be likely to accelerate even further if the United States increases its global engagement and, and diplomatic tensions with certain uh, countries ease a little bit. Um, Beyond those issues, I think DOJ is likely to um, enhance its focus on antitrust enforcement, as, as Andrew mentioned, I think. I think fair housing and fair lending are going to get prominent positions along with a lot of other issues in the Civil Rights Division, voting rights, police department pattern and practice investigations and the like. And environmental enforcement, um, I think, is going to be something that the Biden administration tries to, to, to do aggressively. For reasons that Andrew mentioned, and frankly, President-elect Biden's already promised to establish a new unit at DOJ to enforce the environmental laws, although it is a little unclear how it's going to differ, differ from the Environment and Natural Resources Division that's already there and its criminal section, but I guess we will find out. Turning to the SEC, um, obviously I think there's going to be more aggressive enforcement there, and I think the ESG disclosure issues that Andrew mentioned. Um, Beyond that, just a couple of observations. Um, first, President-elect Biden's campaign policy positions were very supportive of whistleblowers. He's um, promised enhanced protections for whistleblowers. He's, um, he's suggested that whistleblowers are very important, so I think you're likely to see the SEC move to uh, continue to award very large bounties. They've announced some incredibly large bounties recently. Secondly, I think there's, there's going to be greater interest than there has been before in taking on large publicly traded companies and financial institutions for sort of larger scale enforcement matters. Under Jay Clayton, I think the SEC redirected significant resources toward enforcement matters that really involved retail investors. I think under a Biden administration, you can expect greater interest in and greater resources devoted to investigating larger scale matters involving large publicly traded companies and financial institutions. Just, I think, in a nutshell, Wall Street will be in the crosshairs of a new SEC. Um, and then just an observation, um, just something I've noticed in recent weeks, there have been press reports of, of two large U.S. companies in particular that are facing large-scale accounting fraud investigations by the SEC. We have frankly not seen a lot of those since the days of Enron and WorldCom but um, it appears that they may well be ripe for return. And those are the kinds of investigations that are going to fit the political narrative and objectives of a Biden administration when it comes to enforcement. Um, 
briefly on the CFTC. I think the CFTC has actually been one of the only enforcement agencies that definitely became more active and aggressive over the past four years. Um, they asserted authority in FCPA matters for the first time in the more than 40 years since the statute was passed. Um, like the DOJ, they've aggressively pursued spoofing cases. Um, I think all of that and more are going to continue and if, if it follows the general tr trend, expand. Um, Andrew spoke a little bit about the CFPB, so I, I think just I'll agree with him. I think, you know, the CFPB was Elizabeth Warren's brainchild, and she's clearly going to push very hard for aggressive enforcement there. I think the leadership is going to be very aggressive um, in issues around consumer protection, but also access to capital, fair lending and fair insurance and things like that, particularly in light of the Black Lives Matter movement and concerns about systemic racism. Again, very obvious ways to prove to the progressive wing of the party that um, the administration is taking those issues seriously. And then finally, on congressional investigations, I think it's very likely that we're going to see aggressive investigations by the Democratic House, in particular, into financial institutions, primarily led by the House Financial Services Committee and the House Oversight and Reform Committee. Um, Assuming that the runoffs in Georgia that Andrew mentioned allow the Republicans to retain control of the Senate, the House Democrats, frankly, are not likely to get a lot of their bills passed. And unlike the past two years, the House Democrats are also not likely to spend a lot of their time investigating the president if it's President Biden. So most likely, they're going to turn a lot of their attention to another thing that they can do, which is investigating the private sector. And I think financial services, for political reasons, is going to be very high on that list. Um, so I think because they can conduct congressional investigations without regard to Republican control of the Senate, um, I think the House Democrats are likely going to push their policy agenda using embarrassment and making examples out of financial institutions, um, particularly, again, as they relate to these issues of economic inequality and whether or not working class customers are being treated fairly, and it could get very contentious. So as I said, there are going to be some areas we can't anticipate, there are going to be some areas we think we can, but the bottom line is people really need to stay on their toes, make sure you cross your T's, dot your I's, and always think and anticipate how the actions that you're taking are going to look if things don't turn out as you hope or anticipate that they will. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm just going to give a couple of comments and then go to the conclusion. So I'm going to take a, a bit of a contrarian approach. Um, I don't doubt that there will be a significant increase in enforcement uh, and that the size of the penalties will be uh, very large. I, I also think, however, that at least with respect to housing, which is, which is my area, um, there'll be the usual redlining cases and disparate impact will come back in. I think fair lending relative to pricing will be huge. But I think it's going to be more about access to credit and access to capital, as, um, as Michael just said. So a Harvard Joint Center for Housing study shows that over the next 15 years, more than 70% of new household formation will be people of color. So when you talk about access to credit, it's not just enforcing the laws, it's trying to address the underlying problems that lead to um, persons of color having materially lower home ownership rates. And one of the issues, of course, is gonna be the ability to repay requirements. And we saw that uh, the CSTB proposed a revision that would, in effect, loosen the standards and make price a more important factor than debt-to-income ratio or any prescribed underwriting requirements. I actually think that will be continued uh, with, with the new administration. But as, um, as Andrew suggested, I think there's going to be a big emphasis on AI. And when I say AI, I don't mean artificial intelligence. I mean alternative income. Uh, verification and what does it take to bank the unbankable to provide credit scores for people that aren't necessarily 
in the credit system in the same way. So I think that's going to be really huge. But even if somebody were to qualify, the next question is access to capital. And so that Harvard study showed that 50% of these new households, the 70% that will be persons of color, don't have family generational wealth. So what does that mean? That means that down payments are hard to come by in this population. And so I do expect that there's going to be more efforts, whether it's through down payment assistance or whatever, uh, to come up with the money to enable people, uh, persons of color, to access the home lending market. And then aside from access to credit and access to capital, you need access to affordable housing. So um, even if you can qualify for a loan, there's got to be housing stock that you can um, that you can buy. And there is a dearth of affordable housing in this country. Uh, and I think that's going to be an area where there will be a big concentration. This might be an area where you find some deregulation to try to cut down what causes um, problems in, in construction of housing, even though that's more at a local level. So I think that housing and access to housing through credit capital and and affordable housing is going to be a really key issue. Um, last, I think home retention obviously is going to be a big issue depending on what happens with the pandemic. Unlike the last financial crisis, we don't have a situation where there are material declines in housing prices, but we do have a situation where lots of people have lost their jobs and many more may still lose their jobs. And the administration, I think, is going to do everything it can to make sure people don't uh, don't lose their homes. But before we even get to that, the next crisis is tenants and eviction. It's reported that by the end of the moratorium on evictions that expires at the end of this year, unless it's extended, there'll be something like $70 billion in unpaid rents that will come due the minute that evic eviction moratorium uh, goes away. So I think what you'll see is some action um, based on that. So I want to go to the conclusion now. So I want to thank you for tuning in. A couple of reminders. Remember, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording of today's call, and the recording will also be available as a podcast on your preferred podcast platform. And lastly, as mentioned before, if you have any questions related to today's content, you can email them to GFM, Global Financial Markets, GFM at mayorbrown.com. And thanks again for your participation. You may all now disconnect.